Welcome to the Wall Off Podcast, where the goal is to motivate, inspire, and share success principles. I'm your host, George Almasri. Anna Marin is a businesswoman and entrepreneur known for her commitment to growth and ability to seize opportunities. She's originally from Mexico. Her and her family decided to immigrate to Canada when she was about six years old. And from this point, she became a really successful business person, getting involved in our Keller Williams office, uh, originally with uh, Sandy McKay, who is uh, a successful real estate agent in, in the Hamilton area. On this episode, we talked about her journey as an immigrant. We also touched on her real estate portfolio, the hiring process, how she's able to find people to match and to fit into the businesses that she's growing. So I hope you guys will enjoy the episode. Uh, If you do, make sure to share this with somebody who would appreciate the content. And if you want to connect with me, I would love to hear a recent success story that you've had. So tell me about a a real estate investment and how it went well for you by going to www.welloff.ca and booking a call there or on Instagram, you can DM me and the tag is welloffx. So I look forward to connecting with you guys. I appreciate your support and for everyone that's been tuning in for a while, um, greatly appreciate it. Any new listeners, you guys are great too. So thank you for all the support and enjoy the episode. All right, we're here with Anna who is the boss here the boss our, <laughs> boss lady <laughs> the boss lady at our brokerage um she's also an investor she's got a lot of different things on the go so thank you for joining us i got mandy here as a co-host again hi <laughs> <laughs> um so anna tell me about your childhood and uh, childhood. yeah where you grew up and a uh, couple memories we're taking it back eh okay so i was actually born in mexico um i've lived here now 22 years but um when I came at the young age of six, um, we I grew up in Oakville, so I lived in Oakville pretty much my whole life. My parents were very fortunate to be able to get into home ownership fairly early, especially coming in as immigrants. I think we bought our first house within three years of moving to Canada, and um, went to went to Catholic elementary school, St. Joseph's. It doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> and then went to Blake Lock in Oakville for high school. Um, a couple of memories. I mean, I think I had a great childhood. I mean, I, I'm lucky to have a little sister, so we got to experience our childhood together, coming and, you know, starting our family here brand new with no other real family around us, like really creating our Canadian family, if you want to call it that. Um, <clears throat> but I was always a really good student growing up. I, I loved school. I loved learning, loved reading. And then... Um, what else can I tell you? I don't know. What do you want to know about my childhood? Well, I feel I'm, like that's true. Do you want me to give you like my trauma too? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. First of all, just this is has nothing to do with any any real estate or whatever. But yeah. there doesn't seem to be that many Mexicans in Canada. Is that right? Or am I am I wrong? Mm, is there a big like Mexican community? There's here? a huge Mexican community. I would say especially um, in Toronto and in St. Catharines. Really? Yeah, more towards the Niagara region. So like we've definitely found a lot of friends. Um, um, through just like meeting Mexicans in Canada, which is really cool. And I think the community grows more and more. Like there's so much opportunity for people that are coming from Mexico, like well-educated, like my parents were both with university degrees to come and start an awesome life. And the one really cool thing about my parents and like, you know, you, you think about immigration and like there's so many like negative views on it but I'm like immigration has to happen. Like it's happened since humanity started, right? Like we didn't, we weren't all born in Canada. Like we didn't just like become humans here. Like we all came from different parts of the world. And my parents never had a job. Like they always were entrepreneurs growing up. My mom had a daycare for most of my life. Then um, they opened up a restaurant in downtown Oakville, Mexican restaurant. So they did that for a long time. And now they're, you know, they're just enjoying their life, which is awesome. Cool. Um, I had, I think, well, okay, this is kind of weird. I went to a French school. I had like one Mexican in my school. Really? So I don't think French is really popular with, uh, I, I mean, I don't think too many Mexicans really know French, right? Or we're, mm. we're going off on a total tangent. Yeah, this right? is a total tangent. I mean, like, I don't know these things. Maybe we could look up the stats. If Did you ever like. study French? Yeah, I went to French immersion in elementary and high school, and then I started it in university. But then I was like, yeah, I'd rather just do this yeah. in, in English. Stats in English is not, in French, sorry, is not fun. Yeah, that's true um again kind of random but when i went to university because i uh studied in french my whole life basically right and in in french 
the math is a little different. Like instead of putting a period at the end of a number, you, you put a, a comma. A, yeah. Right. And the dollar sign goes after the the numbers instead of before. So it took me a while to get used to d- doing my calculus. The different and things. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was a little different. But anyway. Um, all right. So let's dive into <clears throat> a couple things here because you have, first of all, built a bunch of businesses. You are an investor. You're also really knowledgeable when it comes to hiring people and all that. So why don't we dive into the first part, which would be building businesses. So tell me about how you got started with that and some of your experiences. Yeah, I mean, well, first off, I went to business school. So like I always knew, like based on how my parents raised me, them always owning businesses that I wanted to be an entrepreneur in some ways. I just never really knew what that meant. And then when I moved back home, I was living with my parents and I was like, eh, what do I do? what do I do with my life now, right? That we're kind of left to our own devices after we leave school and we got to figure it out. And so then I just started applying to jobs. I was like, I'm going to find something that aligns with what I did. So I applied to a bunch of different fields, eventually landed upon a real estate job and got hired as an assistant for a real estate team. And I said, this aligns with what I want to do. I also thought back to my parents' journey of coming to Canada and the first person that we became friends with was our realtor. She was a Mexican realtor, big in the Latin community. And I just thought back to that moment. I was like, I would love to help people do that as well. And so, um, yeah, I got into that real estate job and fell in love with the industry. And from there, I knew that I wanted to be in real estate, whatever it was. Like, I wanted to explore all the different opportunities. So that led me to working with Sandy McKay, which I don't know if you've had on the podcast, but... Many times. (laughs) Awesome. I love it. So Sandy and I have basically grown together in in many capacities. But when I started working with him, his team had been around for about a year or two. And I came in and supported more with the inside sales, the operations of the team. And that really led me to become really passionate about building businesses and different aspects of business, how to make businesses more profitable. And again, that just kind of kept leading to more opportunities. I just kept saying yes and yes. And Um, Now, present day, we look at what we've built in two years, we've taken a non-existing, non-existent brokerage and now into like a very well-known brokerage in the Vaughn area. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you start off with a different team? Yes. Oh, you did. Okay. So you worked with another team. How did you connect with Sandy? Just out of curiosity. So I was working on a team and I was there um, kind of like director of operations, supporting, building the team. We got up to about eight realtors at the peak awesome opportunity but uh, during that time I started getting connected into the Young Professionals Network we were looking to bring that into Canada through Keller Williams so it was Dylan Suter myself and Sandy that were kind of the originators in Canada and I didn't know these guys before I just got a call one day from Dylan being like hey Anna do you want to be part of this I'm like sure (laughs) I don't know who you are but I'll do it so we ended up bringing this Young Professionals Network in the first year this was a whole volunteer run operation we ended up growing it to like 120 members and just being part of those guys' worlds and because you know them you know what I'm talking about you see how impactful they can be and I said I need to be around them like I need to surround myself with these kind of people and so I actually just asked Sandy for an opportunity I said I I don't know if you're adding people to your business I don't know if you're looking to grow but I I feel like I would love an opportunity and thankfully they didn't have an opportunity first of all but they created an inside sales role for me to come into the business and that led to me building out the ISA department and doing a lot more of the operational stuff, which wouldn't have happened if I hadn't just asked for the opportunity. Sure. Mandy, do you have any questions? Well, I was just thinking about how saying yes has come up a few times in this conversation. Like you you said, I said yes to this. I said yes to this. Was there any doubt in your mind ever? Am I saying yes to the right thing? Am I saying no to something else? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I I think at that time I was, because I didn't know what I wanted my journey to be, I was like, I'm just going to say yes to everything. And if I mess up, who cares? Like, I'm still Mm -hmm. in a place, like, at that point I didn't have responsibilities. I don't have children. So I was like, I I can mess up a little bit right now and it won't really matter in the long span of things. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also wouldn't allow myself to be in something long term if I wasn't fulfilled or thriving. Yeah. So I knew that of myself. So going into those things, yeah, I I was definitely scared that I would mess up. But I also said, you know what? That's okay. Like failure has to happen for you to grow, right? Yeah. Did you have a mentor at that time? I would say Dylan and Sandy were my mentors. Like they were really 
helping me grow and like pushing me forward and continuing to like um put stress on my limiting beliefs and saying like those things aren't true like a lot of my limiting beliefs were around like I'm too young like why would anybody ever want to work with me why would anybody believe me like a lot of the imposter syndrome that I now talk a lot about because I feel like a lot of people come into this industry with imposter syndrome at the top of their minds sure. um, and it takes a lot of work to remove that let's let's talk a little bit about um so the diving into building businesses so mm -hmm. let's say what what were kind of the main goals that you had when it comes to working with sandy's team or even at this brokerage now what are you aiming to do how do you develop these businesses and grow them and, and all that yeah for sure so <clears throat> at, at mckay realty network what I was really focused on is bringing production to the team. So we've got, you know, real estate agents that are focused on doing the lead generation, lead follow up, going on appointments, scripting and role playing and negotiating contracts. The team really that we wanted to create was to take everything else off of their plate that was not those five things. And so bringing in the ISA department was an extra, not a replacement, but a leverage for our agents to grow their Can business. You explain what the ISA yes. is? Yes. So ISA stands for Inside Sales Associates. So you have individuals that are, they could be licensed realtors, but they're strictly focused on producing appointments for agents to go on and then close into transactions. So we started basically with that program, bringing in uh, like a bunch of newbies, training them with the scripts, putting them on the phone for eight hours a day. And then that was contributing to about a third of the business. Mm -hmm. And so like for, for that aspect, we were just looking to grow our production. And like still to this day, MRN does amazing production year over year. And I would credit that to like having a strong foundation with that ISA department and then nurturing that database over time. And MRN is McKay Realty Network. Yes. I'm so sure. sorry. I have acronyms. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. yeah MRN McKay Realty Network. Um, and then like really with, with the team, like they they have their own goals now. Like I stepped away from the team when we launched KW Legacies and um, now our goal with KW Legacies, I mean, for, for you guys know, like we want to create the home of thriving millionaires. And for us, that means just being able to create an environment for our people to grow wealth and become amazing individuals. Um, and so just in our short two and a half years since we launched, we've added about 150 agents to our network. Um, we've partnered with other businesses. We're about to launch a brand new office space in the next couple months. Um, so our goal now is just continuing to grow, bringing in opportunities for our agents to grow through real estate investing, through the Vaughn Investors Club. And um, I, I mean, I could tell you all my goals if you want, but I think those are the high level ones that we're super excited about. Yeah. Did you, um, for example, Oprah's always talked about, you know, becoming Oprah, like she never had that vision for herself. So did you ever see yourself in this role? What did that look like a few years back? No, definitely <laughs> had no idea that I would become a team leader or CEO for a brokerage. Mm -hmm. But um, I was always really close with my team leader at the Hamilton office when I was part of the Hamilton office. And like as much as I respected him, I also was like, oh, this guy, he's always on my case to increase my goals. And, you know, like he was always pushing us to do better. So I really did respect him. And so when the opportunity for launching this brokerage came up again, I was like, OK, I could stay on the team and like do what I'm comfortable with now. Like I've gotten pretty good at this stuff and I'm, I'm having fun or I could like push myself out of my comfort zone and be like, OK, I'm going to go a completely different route and do something I've never done before. At the time that, <clears throat> excuse me, at the time that that opportunity was coming up too, like KW Keller Williams was doing a big push on the team leader role. And they were talking a lot about how the role itself is basically like getting your MBA in business and you learn a lot. And that's really the main reason I took it. It was not for the, the money or what was promised. It was more for knowing that I could get knowledge that I didn't have and then just keep growing myself. Do you, th do you think that your role as team leader is kind of perfect for you? Like, do you feel like you're in a groove, you're w right where you should be? Or do you see yourself maybe doing something different in a couple years or in the future? Yeah, great question. I mean, th what's really cool is um, when I was in the administrative role, like I loved that, I loved operations, loved building systems. When I was in the inside sales role, I hated prospecting initially, but I got really good at it. 
And then coming into the team leader, it encompasses both of those things. You need to have the operational background, but you need to be fearless when it comes to prospecting and and lead generation because you're looking to build a business and you're selling an environment or a culture for people to come and join. So without those two skills that I built before, I would not be as, I guess, fulfilled in this role. So I would say, yes, it's a good role and it does suit who I am and my skills really well. But I also know that our opportunity map is way bigger than this. So I will not be a team leader forever. That's for sure. I want to be able to give this opportunity to the next person that wants to take it. Mm-hmm. Um, one, I think one last question on this. So for the people that are listening, maybe, you know, the last couple of years when the market was on fire, everyone wanted to sort of be a realtor, right? Everyone mm-hmm. wanted to get their license. I don't know if that's still the case now with the sort of little bit of a downturn in the market. Uh, but for anyone who's considering getting into real estate, what are your thoughts on joining at this time? Also, for people that may want to join part time, do you recommend that? Just kind of let's get your take on that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I was reading a stat the other day, and I think this was both for U.S. and Canada stats, or maybe it was just U.S. And I'd be curious to see the Canadian stats. But they said something like 60,000 people left the industry just this past year, like the last six months. So I think that in COVID, when employment was very challenging and people were losing jobs left, right, and center, certain industries weren't able to thrive, a lot of people did consider what they needed to do with their lives. And that ended up leading to like people getting into the business. Now, I definitely see less people getting into the business. That's not a bad thing for us, though. Like, I feel like there's a lot of people in this industry that don't treat it as a business or as a career. It's more like, oh, it's kind of like an extra added income, which is not a bad thing. But if you're thinking about it from a service standpoint, having a client that works with someone that is full time committed to the business, that is, um, you know, that that's their main focus, that is constantly challenging pushing themselves and growing to learn the ins and outs versus somebody that has a full-time job doesn't really push themselves doesn't really learn the ins and outs and then you know just supplements their their income with potential real estate transactions from their friends and family I would say the service is probably going to come better with the person that's full-time in the business would you guys agree for sure definitely agreed yeah so I mean that is challenging but like people are going to make the decisions that they feel like they need for their business I would say for us like we we don't work with part-time agents anymore we decided uh, you know based on our commitment levels to our agents that we want people that are coming in full-time And I'm a big believer in master of one or master of none or like the one thing. There's so many principles around this, right? Like if you are spreading yourself too thin, you have too many different focuses, you're never going to be great at any of them. So it's better to just pick one and be awesome. So I would say like if you are considering getting your license, it's never a bad time to get in. But consider your options, like look for a brokerage or a team that is willing to take you on and give you the mentorship and training to really be successful because times are changing so quick. Like everything is changing day by day and you need to be up to speed with what's happening to to really be successful. Yeah, that's like uh, when when people talk about investing in real estate and they might ask me like, hey, have you tried Airbnb or uh, whatever student rentals? And like I, I always... My answer is always, I I don't want to get involved in that stuff. I just want to stay focused on what I'm doing because when you start dabbling in all these different strategies, like it it really distracts you and I think it really limits your growth. Yeah. It's probably the exact same thing in anything else that you do in life, right? A hundred percent. We're reading this book. It's awesome. It's called Essentialism. Have you guys heard of this? Mm -mm. I forget the author. We're reading it as a a team. And uh, in one of the chapters, they say, the the most expe- the most successful people don't say yes they say no and so that's like something that's been sticking in my head lately because I have been saying yes most of my career and now I'm getting to the point where I would like to say no because I know my journey a lot better mm. what what do you guys think about that I think that when you say yes you're saying no to something else so you really need to intrinsically know yourself Mm -hmm. and your goals and your priorities and for example we have a young son saying yes to so many things limits our time with our son um so i definitely see the value in that but i agree at the time that you were saying yes to everything your journey was much different and your life was much different Mm -hmm. i'm finding it fascinating listening to you you were talking about being a kid and constantly reading and learning and that has 
stayed with you. That characteristic has stayed with you. Yeah, for sure. Your whole life. And you're still working with the team, reading books, learning, <laughs> expanding your, your knowledge. So I think that that's pretty fascinating. And all of these layers have compounded now. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 100%. Just to add to that, I think saying no is also kind of a personality trait with some people like it's a lot easier for me to say no than it is for mandy or even when we go As out a somewhere. people pleaser you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even when we go out somewhere i'm happy to like just walk out of a room if i'm not getting value from being there or if i'm not enjoying it or whatever mandy's always like wait no what if they see us what if, what if it's somebody- <laughs> rude you know it's just that um yeah that personality trait you're right yeah so Anyway. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. If you're like looking at the disc, if you're you're an like an I something, right? ID. I think so. Yeah. I'm have to redo it very again. similar. <laughs> so like I'm, I, it gives me like anxiety saying no sometimes. But it's all about how you phrase it. For yourself, you're probably like a D. So I don't something. remember. I did it so long ago. <laughs> That's okay. Thing. It was a while. But yeah, like yeah. people that are more dominant, like they're like very direct and easy to. I definitely to say have no. to say that since I started. I don't know if you felt the same way, but setting boundaries within the business, um, for example, not returning calls after a certain time, mm-hmm. and just protecting those boundaries. My business changed. It actually grew um, from saying no to more things. Um, but that was, again, a certain point in my life when I could actually do that. So, after yeah. After we I, had some arguments, like, why are you taking calls at 9 p.m.? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but anyway, <laughs> but yeah, I definitely see value in saying no to more things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we need, but a, we need one of your book lists. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to provide that for sure. <laughs> well, we'll uh, we can maybe attach it to the show notes or something. For people. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, okay, so let's dive into your rental properties. Mm-hmm. How you got started as an investor? You were obviously uh, working with MRN, McKay mm-hmm. Realty Network. They were really investor focused. And I'm sure being around them all the time made you want to become an investor or maybe even before that you wanted to. But let's let's dive into that journey. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think I would have bought real estate if I had not worked with that team because <clears throat> that's all they kept pushing. And even from the support that the team gives to the knowledge that they put you put in front of you. I, I mean, it's almost like how can I not buy real estate at this point? So I was very lucky to like have that upbringing with the team. Um, And honestly, how it happened was just like myself and my fiance were just like, we need to buy property. Like he was seeing what I was doing in real estate. He's in a completely different world. He's on the finance crypto world and (laughs) like knows nothing about real estate. So I I basically said like at that point I had my license. I'd been in the business for a while and I was like, we're going to buy property and we're going to do it together. And he was like, all right, sounds good. So we started exploring different areas. And I think at that point, like Hamilton, I don't think Hamilton is, um, is like, what do you call it? Like, it's not like overrated, but I, at that point it was definitely really hot. And I was like, well, we could buy in Hamilton, but we don't have a ton of money for the down payment. Why don't we actually look at other markets? And, um, so like, I think the average price point in Hamilton at that time was like 600,000. And so we were looking like St. Catharines, a little bit lower. What year was this, by the way? This was 2020? 2020. 2020, 21. And just to put things into context, how old were you in 2020? Um, how old am I now? <laughs> uh, that was three years ago, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm t- I would, 25. I was 25. Yeah. So awesome. just for the people listening, like <laughs> you're pretty young still. You're, you're 28, right? Yes. And you're a leader of a brokerage, a team leader. You own multiple rental properties. You have multiple businesses. It's pretty good. But sorry, continue. (laughs) Thanks. I I like the boost. (laughs) Sounds good. Um, Yeah. So at that time, like one thing that was really cool is um, we were just launching KW Legacies and there was a contest for how big you could grow your 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 market center in terms of like bringing on agents and, and the profitability. And I like joined as part of that contest and we ended up coming in fourth place. So I didn't even use any of my own money to put as a down payment. I actually ended up using the money from that contest to put towards our down payment and deposit, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we ended up buying that. I, I was telling you before the episode started, it was in the middle of COVID. So we didn't even actually go see the property. We saw a virtual tour online. Um, it was really lucky how that property came up because they had sold and then the buyer never closed. So they re- they were about to relist it. I was actually working with a realtor in Windsor. Shout out Sarah Laporte <laughs> out there. Um, and she's like, this one's about to come on the market. Do you guys want to take a look at it? They sent us like the virtual tour. We 
we checked it out and then that night we're like okay we'll put in an offer and um they had sold it for like 440 we came in at 450 got it accepted and closed within three weeks and then we never actually went to go check out the property till after but we did all the numbers don't worry about it we did all the numbers um and we've just gotten so lucky with that property we have um a full-time tenant that came with the property paying good rent um works at the canola plant in windsor very respectful guy and then the other unit was vacant we had to do a bit of renos we the the time that we went to go to the property we tried to do them ourselves and we're like yeah f this we're just gonna (laughs) get the property manager to do it so we we at least spent a little bit time when windsor like learning the market and learning the area we actually love it there's just so many opportunities coming like i don't know if you guys know there's an electric vehicle battery plant cool that they're there it's going to create about ten thousand jobs in the next few years I don't know when it's officially like being built and everything, but at least I know that that's a place that is secure to invest that is going to continue to grow. Um, and now we're cash flowing like a thousand bucks a month and we don't even have to think about it. Amazing. Like it just goes right into our mortgage account, pulls right out from our mortgage account. And um, yeah, it's been like I, I told you before as well. It's been like a business. That's what we treat it like. We treat it fairly like we're still... I think thinking about it from a perspective of like, do we raise rents every year? We don't want to be the landlords that raise rents. That's what at least Evan's perspective. But we're also thinking about our future and how we can keep scaling. You have to raise rent. You have to. I know. Yeah. Evan was the one on the other side. I was like, no, Evan, we're raising rent. <laughs> this is Don Chen, mortgage agent with Pineapple Financial. Today, I want to introduce you to a special mortgage product called Readvanceable Mortgage. The special feature about this product is that as you pay down the principal portion, it auto converts into a line of credit. And this allows you a cost effective way to access the equity in your home without having to go through a refinance or incur high legal and penalty costs. I would love to connect with you for all your mortgage-related questions. You can reach me at 647-961-3281, or you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at The Mortgage Dawn. Yeah, we we had this argument once uh, with somebody who he labeled himself as a socialist. And he was saying, like, landlords are so greedy for raising rents. And then, well, because his girlfriend had a condo, right? And um, I was asking her, do they, does the... Uh, condo corporation raise your maintenance fees do your property taxes go up and she's like yes yes i'm like okay so why aren't you raising rents <laughs> it's mm-hmm. the same thing right you, yeah. you gotta gotta offset the increases in your expenses <clears throat> yeah. um, not, not only that like cost of living goes up every year even with the minimum increases you're not even m- matching the cost of living yeah exactly so you you go from owning this place in windsor your first property is a duplex you do really well you're mm-hmm. cash flowing really well uh what happens from there well with regards to your portfolio yeah so my dad ended up buying a duplex back in 2018 in hamilton for like 440 and it was already converted it's uh, like a nice little bungalow on the mountain and so just over the past couple years we decided to get into business together myself and my dad and so now we run that together we've been renting it out and um that one's doing pretty good too i think the better opportunity in that one is for somebody to come in and like buy it off from us in the next couple of years and then use that money. But like, we're going to continue to use equity from both properties to buy more. Mm -hmm. That's definitely like the next five year goal. Yeah. Is there a third property as well? A third? Just those two right now. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan? Like you have so many different things going on. Yeah. Um, You're obviously really involved in growing this business. She's also a coach. Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll talk about that too. (laughs) Um, Do you plan on like owning a certain number of properties or having a certain cash flow number coming in each month what what are you thinking with your portfolio yeah i think uh, for evan and myself we still really want to get clarity about what that looks like um but i do know we want to keep owning more properties and i think for us that means getting to 10 first making that our first milestone and then going from there we also want to own property in mexico like it's like i i have family there like i want to be able to have a spot where we can go and travel to whenever we want to go visit and I could also see myself living out of Canada eventually. So <laughs> starting to think about what that looks like for sure. Um, like Costa Rica has been near and dear to our family's hearts. And like Evan's parents go there now for six months of the year. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we're exploring a lot of things like that more outside of Canada than inside Canada. But for our investment properties within Canada, 
I know that Windsor is going to be our market because now we know it really well. Mm -hmm. And like we were saying before, like stay in your lane. Like people choose to invest in Hamilton and that's their bread and butter. Amazing. Or Hamilton and Niagara, whatever it is. For us, I think it's Windsor because it's still fairly untapped. The prices have only gone lower in the last little bit. So you have even more opportunity. And it's so close to the U.S. Um, so there's actually a lot of people that live in Canada and work in the U.S. as well, like in the car plants. Um, so I just think it's always going to be a place that has really low vacancy, is very sustainable, just like Hamilton was like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You mentioned 10 properties, that mm -hmm. that's kind of a milestone that you're going for. Why do you want 10? Well, I mean, that'll ideally bring us to like about 10 million in like our net worth, mm -hmm. right? And so that's just a number that we've kind of conjured for ourselves. It's not like there's a tie-in behind it. It's more like, let's get to that number. Because when I think about like financial freedom, I also think like you can set a goal, but that's probably not going to be the forever goal. You might set a number today, but once you actually achieve that, you want to be able to now have your next mm -hmm. opportunity. Um, and I think for both myself and Evan, we've never really had to envision our future beyond just ourselves because we we don't have kids. Like we're still pretty selfish when it comes to our relationship. Like we, we just care about each other. And so we have to start thinking now about like, okay, yes, how are we going to keep growing together? And then also like if we choose to have kids now, how can we ensure that they have a great financial future? Mm -hmm. Andy, anything you want to ask? If you don't have any questions, I got the next one. I have a question for you guys, yeah. like, because I want to get clarity on what I want my vision to be. So how do you guys have like a number of properties that you want to own? How did you okay, so let create me that goal? This. Okay. Did you and Evan, so before George and I got married, we actually sat on the couch one night and we wrote out what we wanted our goal, our, what our vision for our lives were, mm -hmm. not showing each other our papers yet. We wrote them, our goals in a variety of different categories, and then we swapped papers and they excuse me they were actually very similar wow was this uh was this when we did the like the five circles yeah yeah so that would be personal financial business family and spiritual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we wrote down goals for each one of those categories and yeah so we swapped our sheets and like a bunch of the stuff we wrote down was the same we're very oh, that's similar. awesome yeah. so that might be an exercise for you guys to kind of get some clarity around and have at least have that discussion yeah for sure we've done the future self exercise but we only did it for the first three years so it would be interesting yeah. to go look at it more for a longer term but let me answer your question so yes <laughs> initially i had a goal of like owning a certain number of properties or doors and then I changed that later on to to ca to a cash flow number. Yeah. Because I realized like, you know, owning a whole bunch of doors doesn't really do anything for us. Um, we're going to be, you know, rich on paper, but we're not going to have the lifestyle that we want. Totally. So, um, yeah. So we, we set a goal to uh, get to $15,000 a month in net positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. And that would give us the freedom to do what we want. And then another uh, part of that is to own some real estate and well own a vacation home in Italy so that we can travel. So mm -hmm. uh, across Europe and, and enjoy that with, uh, with the family. So that's, I don't know. Was that, the, yeah. was that, did that answer your question? Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. That gives me clarity too. Cause I, I agree with you. Like, yeah, you could own a hundred homes, but if you're in negative cash flow every single month, like, are you thriving? No. Right. Exactly. Yeah. If you over leverage or you don't set up your portfolio in a certain way, then it doesn't really benefit you. Yeah. 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 I think for us, that's always been like the priority is like get to cash flow. Like it doesn't matter what we pay, like as long as it's cash flowing. What kind of strategies do you guys use? Well, we we work. I did break it down initially and I looked at, okay, if, if I have like $300 a month of cash flow, how many properties would I need to get to 15000 But then I recently had somebody on the show who's Casey Wong. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know him, but he told me about his strategy, which was to basically, he sold off a triplex that he had and used the equity from that to buy a student rental apartment building, which had like 50 something door um, bedrooms, 18 units, but like 50 something bedrooms. And he just lives off that one property. Wow. It generates enough cash flow to supplement all of his income and he can put his kids through private school and all that. So I'm like, you know what? That sounds like such an amazing strategy. We have a bunch of smaller properties. When we have enough equity in there, we can just sell it, buy one building 
and then that that'll get us to our goal yeah just consolidate yeah Mm -hmm. exactly so i think that's going to be the strategy moving forward i don't have an exact plan but i have a general idea of how to get there okay i think with investing because there's so many different ways that you can do it and there's a lot of fear around it if somebody's just thinking about starting coming to the Vaughn Investment Club, going to other investment events and just being around investors that are doing the same thing, I think is really important because then you can ask questions. You're hanging out with the people you want to be like, like you were talking about with Sandy mm-hmm. and Dylan. Um, and I think that that has been a big eye opener for me because I always envisioned myself just owning a couple of maybe small duplexes, semis or you know detached properties. Um, And since meeting George, my vision has changed. I think together we've kind of grown and we utilize the properties we already owned to purchase more and grow from there. Mm -hmm. And And um, working with investors as well. And working with investors. And and George has focused (coughs) his attention on it 100%. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, you guys have like a really good thing going on because you're the sales side, you're the investing side and it really works well for you. I think a that's lot important. Of, uh, a lot of the guys at the office are jealous because they're like, you know, you can go golf. <laughs> Man, he's going to take care of, you know, making sales. I have to sit <laughs> here on the phones all day. <laughs> it, it's what you're it's what you're good at. Right. Like, I know I know that I'm I don't that I'm good with people and that I'm good at building relationships and I'm good at that side of the business. Whereas George is very not cutthroat. That's not the word that like I like analytical. Yes. And very um, non-emotional, non-emotional when it comes to, um, investments, Mm -hmm. which I think is really important because I am not, I'm not bleeding heart. I'm not Evan Mm -hmm. that, Oh, maybe we shouldn't raise rents, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, yeah, I think it, you do, you definitely need both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we touched on your portfolio and I think the last thing we were going to talk about is like the hiring process. So you've worked with, well, you've hired a lot of people here, but you've also hired, administrators, VAs, virtual assistants. Um, let's let's talk a bit about that. For somebody who's looking to hire their first person, their, their first uh, administrator or whatever, what should they do? Yeah, I mean, just like a disclaimer too, like this is not just for a business. Like if I say like a lot, I'm sorry, let me change that. Um, disclaimer, when you're thinking about building yourself as a, up as an investor, and you're thinking about it as a business, I think it's important to also understand the hiring process. So I think this is why we want to talk about it. Um, having a strong hiring process is the most important thing that you can do when you're starting to get into business with people, whether it be like a direct employee or a partner or um, even a preferred vendor, like an allied resource that you're or getting into business with. Contractor. Anyone really. Yeah, anyone that you would consider your team that's going to support you from, you know, the point that you're starting to the finish line in whatever it is, whether it's a business or investing, whatever. Um, so for us, that was a huge, huge lesson when we were at McKay Realty Network working together. Um, we didn't have a solid hiring process at the beginning and it started to really really show we would bring people in just with um you know typical question and answer interview be like okay they they sound like they're great let's bring them in and then slowly we would discover they were not a great fit um and i mean thankfully we're in such a cool world within keller williams where you have a lot of systems and models already created for you and you don't have to start from scratch you just follow a proven system so since I want to say five years ago, we've utilized the career visioning model to do all of our hiring, both for partners, uh, for investors, for employees, anyone that's joining our world, we do the career visioning process. And so I'll explain what that means. Um, and you can do this too, Not even if you're not with Keller Williams, you can use personality assessments. There's like the DISC, which we talked about, DISC. Um, there's the InterJ, I think it's called, assessment. There's a ton of them out there. But I think what's important about doing some sort of personality assessment with someone that you're looking to get into business with is just getting a deeper idea of who that person is before you get into business with them. Like you can have, you know, the person that shows up in front of you or you can really truly learn on paper, you know, how they operate, what their learning styles are, what their opportunities and strengths are. And so that's really the first part of the KPA process or the career visioning process is doing that personality assessment. And then you go into a series of, it's like six, seven interviews to make sure that that person is a good fit. 
That's actually really similar to how, how you would get into business with a, like an investment partner. Mm-hmm. So it's not, you don't do a, a disc or a KPA or whatever else, but I always, whenever I'm talking to someone and we're thinking about joining forces and investing together, I have a list of questions that I go through. Uh, I really want to get to know them. I want to know what their goals are. Uh, what are they trying to achieve? Are we in line? Do they want to sell within six months or do they want to keep the property long term? So it's kind of the same same sort of thing really yeah. in anything that you do. And also with like contractors, I also really want to get to know the people that I'm working with because you don't want to be working with um, the wrong contractor as well or yeah. it could lead to a lot of... Uh, headaches for you so it it applies to anything really and and any sort of business partner that you have for sure like I said we've done it with people that have partnered with us in business Um, maybe not like the full thing like you're not interviewing them for a job but at least you're doing the assessment and then validating it to make sure that it is who they are and through that you get to learn you know the the things to watch out for versus the things that are going to be really great strengths that might align with something that you need Um, and it really just helps you avoid that dating period of being in business with someone we know that weird dating period of like three to six months where you're really starting to get to know the person, not just the way that they showed up on that first meeting or second meeting, but who they truly are. And um, that's so important. Like you you can hire someone today without doing any kind of interview process. And you're literally just taking dice and throwing it. You're, you're literally gambling your money, your time, your energy. Yeah. So you can do that or you can follow a system. I would follow the system all day long. Sure. And it's also potentially, I mean, in an office environment where that person can like be sort of a poison, right? Where they impact everyone else in the office. Yeah, let me tell you. Yeah, it, it's so true. Um, one person can really interrupt and disrupt culture mm-hmm. in, a, in a heavy way. And that's the one thing I talk about this often. The culture for me, the environment is the most important because I have been in workplaces where the culture is not yeah. is not one of you know productivity, of support, of collaboration. And I, I never want anyone to be in that. So that's the second really nice thing about kw mandy coming from remax at one point um or another brokerage <laughs> <laughs> beep I, yeah. I uh i was with royal page when i started and the culture here is totally different because i can like first of all everyone's really close i like all the guys you know they play basketball together or they they go to the driving range together or whatever i can go to anyone anyone who's really busy like sandy or dylan or anyone and ask them for a few minutes of their time and and pick their brains it's it's really cool to have this kind of culture here very collaborative very giving yeah it's definitely we're building something really special yeah i think And I mean, this is what I've seen. I've only really been with KW, but this is what I've heard and what I've seen. I think within other companies, not all, but within some other companies, there's a lot of ego in this industry because you're you're not pushing a business. You're pushing yourself most of the time. Mm -hmm. And so when you push yourself and you're constantly pushing yourself, you only think about yourself. And so I think we really tend to get away from that collaborative effort and it becomes more of like a, you know, I, I eat what I kill type of mentality yeah. versus I really think the opposite can be true. Like if we are all collaborating, working together, sharing investment strategies, I mean, we're all able to grow a lot faster rather than trying to do thing, things, um, you know, creatively or starting from scratch. Why wouldn't you just do something that's already been done? There's no new ideas here. Exactly. And it's the same thing with uh, real estate investing. Like investors are so willing to help other people. It's it's amazing to, to see that. So mm-hmm. um, I love that. For So for anyone listening, if they're thinking about getting their license or they're in the process, they can reach out to you. To or they're already them. licensed as yep. well. Yes, that's yes. true. They can reach out to you, set up a meeting, see if uh, maybe they can you know, be a good fit here and everything would work out. Mm-hmm. Um, so just do you feel like there's any final sort of messages you want to share or anything we haven't covered? Well, we didn't talk about the virtual assistants, and I know that's something that you wanted to bring up. Um, I mean, if you are looking to hire or you're just looking to get some leverage in your life or whatever it is, um, I always find virtual assistants have been amazing and super pivotal in helping us grow because, um, I mean, first of all, it's a lot more cost effective than hiring someone locally in Canada. <clears throat> and then, I mean, the the pr- product of their work is equally or sometimes better quality. Um, so I'm a big proponent of 
um, leveraging through virtual assistants, you know, creating opportunities for those in other countries. So we've got three virtual assistants within legacies that are forward facing and then two back end virtual assistants that do all of our transactions and support um, more like the data entry and so on. Um, and we've been using virtual assistants for six years, five to six years. Yep. Um, is there anything that you wanted me to specifically Where do mention? Go? to find a virtual assistant. Yeah, I mean, there's so many co great companies out there. I know Cyberbacker, there's there's other ones that have been created. You can also use like Upwork if you wanted to hire directly versus through a company. Um, but the one that we use is called Cressida. Maybe we can put the link in the chat. Um, Joe actually was our first executive assistant for Legacies when we first opened. And we really helped push her to launch her own virtual assistant company. And now she really feeds us amazing, talented individuals that can work with both us and our teams, our agents. And um, it's a really great ecosystem because obviously they get a, an opportunity to grow their lives, their careers, something that they probably wouldn't have had. Um, otherwise, and we get to also grow our businesses as a result through more cost-effective leverage and ultimately just grow a lot faster. Yeah. So I would assume that um, when you're hiring a VA, let's say somebody wanted to just use a VA to uh, find some off-market deals or whatever, I'm talking about specifically for mm -hmm. investors, then you should probably try like a couple different people just as an initial period. I'm sure there's like a whole process around that, but uh, don't just commit to one person right off the bat, right? Well, I would say if you're going through a company, they have a pretty good hiring process. Like a lot of them do follow like a, a similar process to the one that I mentioned. Um, so you're able to see, you know, like four, five, six, seven different candidates and then decide who's going to be the best fit. Um, things that I've done before is like give them a, more of like a what do you call it like a technical test. Mm -hmm. So I'd be like, hey, I need you to put this in a spreadsheet for me and format it this way and then send it back and then if they do it properly and they follow the instructions well more likely that I'll probably get into business with them or if it's from like a marketing perspective I'll ask them to send me their portfolio so I can see the different things that they've created um, so there's ways to know like how people work without getting into business with them mm -hmm. but if you're going more like the Upwork or Fiverr route and you're just doing more on a contract basis rather than like a longer term contract um, yeah I mean you probably have to do a little bit of trial and error yeah. to find the right person. Yeah, that's cool. I used to work for a, a tech company. Um, this was right after university and they started replacing us because I was doing quality assurance with um, people from, I guess, India, I think it was. And uh, that was my first taste of outsourcing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's becoming really popular now. A, yeah. a lot of people are doing it. Okay, so final thoughts um and also what services do you provide how do people get in contact with you yeah for sure i mean final thoughts thank you for having me on the podcast i'm honored and it's uh great to have you guys in my world i just love you guys so much so yeah um don't cry, don't cry. i won't cry i won't <laughs> cry um and then how people can get in touch with me is um best place would be my instagram that's the most active platform and it's at anna marin a-n-a-m-a-r-i-n dot k-w and I mean, you can check me out there. I've got all my stuff on my on my page, my podcast, my coaching stuff. So, and your goal, goal. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about coaching, but your goal is to grow this brokerage, right? Yes. Bring people on board, people that are like minded, mm -hmm. and then um, coaching. Is there? Do you have any goals around that? Yeah, I mean, for, from legacy standpoint, you you hit the nail on the head. We're just looking to grow with the right individuals. We want to be in business with people that want to be wealthy and are growth minded. And then from the coaching perspective, I mean, I think I love coaching the people in our worlds, but there's also so much opportunity for me to help others grow their businesses outside of KW Legacies. And so that's why I got into coaching as well. Um, my goal there is just to keep a full roster. For me, that's about 15 clients. I'm about 11 right now. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just, just help a, a group of people All grow right. their businesses. Any final words from you, Mandy? I just find it inspiring that you've created this world for yourself and done so much in a short span of time. So I think that the world is your oyster and there's so much ahead. So just Yeah, I mean, I, that's actually a point I wanted to mention 
this will be my final point. <laughs> it's like everyone will do things in their own timing. Like I used to look up to other people that had achieved something. And like, I mean, Dylan's a great example of that. He bought a ton of real estate in such a short amount of time. But you can't compare yourself to others. Like your journey is unique and special in its own. And you have to figure out what works for you and what you want to do. So I always keep reminding myself that. And I feel like others probably listening to podcasts like this might say, well, I haven't achieved that or maybe think about their own lives and feel a type of way because they haven't hit success in their mind. But again, success for you is what you deem it to be. So surround yourself with the right people and I'm sure you can achieve anything that you want. Yeah, I think that's really important. Comparison is the thief of joy. Right? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Um, That's a great note to end off on. Yeah, (laughs) thank you for joining us. Thank you um, so much. We'll make sure to include all your information in the show notes and uh, we'll be in touch. Sounds good. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Well Off Podcast. If you enjoy the show, then I'd really appreciate if you left us a review on iTunes and let us know your thoughts. In order for us to get a larger audience, it's really important to have reviews, so your support is extremely appreciated. And also, don't forget to share the podcast with your friends and family. Until next time, I'm George Almasri. Have a great day.